It's good to see you this morning. If you do have your books, that Donnie mentioned, if you uh, want to be turning to page 13, that's where the lesson for this hour to begin, and you might want to turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 2. I trust you are well, and I trust you are safe. And I thank you for your presence and for your support and for your kindness and the hospitality that you have shown to Carlin and I. Appreciate your prayers. Thank you, Dickie, for the kind prayer this morning. I appreciate that. I want you to know that I covet your prayers and I appreciate you for them and that you all are continually in our prayers. So if you have your Bibles... In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let's read together beginning in verse 1. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrariwise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things." To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I gave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it also in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. In this second letter, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth is having a follow-up discussion with that church about a situation that he addresses in his first letter. In his first letter in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul addressed the problem the church had there at the Corinth of a brother who was living in an immoral, ungodly, adulterous relationship with his father's wife. And the church there at Corinth wasn't doing anything about it. Now why, whatever, but Paul addressed the situation. This brother was living in this immoral and godly situation. He called them out for it and told them that uh, they needed to rebuke this brother and they needed to deal with the sin that he was engaged in because it was having a leavening or a negative effect on the church. needed to get it out, get it out. Well, apparently, they took the apostles' instructions to heart. And like sometimes when people are sometimes called out, they go to another extreme. And the punishment, as Paul describes it now in his second letter, that they inflicted upon this brother who was in sin had its desired effect brought this brother to repentance. And in his remorse and in his sorrow, now Paul is concerned about another issue. And that is that they are maybe going too far in their, quote, punishment of this brother. And he says, it's it's sufficient. You've done enough. His brother's down, he did something wrong, he's remorseful, and it's time to lift him up. Lest he 
goes off the deep end. And the point is, there's the danger of him obviously being lost because of this. But there was a danger that in what they were doing, that that could also become sinful. And there's a good lesson in that. I think many times we need to remember that. We get disgusted when we see people doing things blatantly out in the open public that are sinful. And maybe we hear of some brother or sister who's done something and we just shake our head or whatever. Sometimes it gets it gored, like what happened in the first book. But sometimes I wonder if uh, people's tendencies is to not be forgiving when there is genuine sorrow and remorse and a genuine attempt on a person's part to try and make things right. And I saw a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that, not just in my relationship with my brethren and my church experience, but in my work experience. There were a lot of people during my careers, my career, whether it was engineers, managers, supervisors, some, some person who'd make a mistake. Folks would get mad. They want to fire them, get rid of them, not have anything to do with them. And uh, I would intervene. I said, I think this person is worth salvaging. And I have discussions sometimes with managers who say, I think you're crazy. <laughs> and I say, well, put it on me if it doesn't work out. I said, if you give me the opportunity to work with this person, I guarantee you I can give you a good employee that will add long-term value. Now, I could give you examples of people who you never heard of, it wouldn't mean anything to you. But I want to give you an example, it's in your book, if you've read ahead of time, you already know where I'm going with this, of a person who is a public figure. Public figures, uh, when they make mistakes, it can be pretty ruthless. It can be very, very ruthless. Because a lot of folks see people who are, who are su successful and doing real good, well, if it's a jealousy factor, envy factor, or just, just downright resentment, when a public figure makes a mistake, people pile on. I mean, they just, they, you can just really be ruthless. Well, I want to talk to you about a person who I had a chance to do something with, and that's Bruce Pearl. Let me tell you how it happened, and the story's there in your, your book. I was talking to uh, Coach Phil Fulmer, who was the former head coach for the University of Tennessee football and then athletic director. He had participated, I've told you before, about our Principal Center Leadership Program. Uh, he and I have become friends over the years. We, we talk occasionally, and we were talking one day on the phone and he said, Keith, he said, I've got somebody I want to recommend for your program. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm good. I'm all the time looking for someone who can participate in our program. I said, Coach, who you got in mind? He said, Bruce Pearl. And when he did, I went silent. Because at that time, Coach Pearl had been fired as the head basketball coach for the University of Tennessee. And the reason he'd gotten fired was his program had come under investigation by the NCAA, and during the investigation, he lied. Coach Pearl would say, they asked me a thousand questions and I lied on two of them. I told the truth on 998, but the two that I lied on is what got him in trouble. 
So he got suspended from coaching for three years by the NCAA. Because he got suspended, he couldn't coach, the University of Tennessee fired him. Now his actions not only brought shame and reproach upon himself and his family and upon the university, but also upon the state of Tennessee. Because believe it or not, I graduated from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, by the way. I bleed orange. Any Alabama fans out there? Okay. Don't throw anything at me. Believe it or not, there are some people who don't like the University of Tennessee. And nothing gives them more delight than the fact that they can cast stones and aspersions on the University of Tennessee because one of their coaches messed up, and he messed up. He messed up. So I went silent. And Coach Fulmer said, Keith, we have on Thursday mornings a men's Bible class. A bunch of us in Knoxville get together at a restaurant. We eat breakfast, and we have a Bible class. And Coach Pearl always comes to our men's Bible class on Thursday morning and said, right now, he is really down. He's really down. He's really struggling. And if he could participate in your program, this would be a good thing for him. It would lift him up. Now, when Coach Fulmer said that to me, it, it kind of shocked me out of the silence. And I said, Coach, give Coach Fulmer my number. Tell him if he's interested to call me. So within an hour, I got a phone call from Coach Pearl. We talked, had a good conversation. I told him what I was wanting. He'd come, speak to our employees, speak to people in the community. We would invite some young people from the local high school to come. We were having a charity golf event. We wanted him to play in that. So if you agree to that, you're willing to come under those conditions, we'll work it out. So he agreed. I, I drew up a contract, sent it to him. We invited him to come. So the day he came I, of our event, I met him at a local bed and breakfast, and we had breakfast together. Had a real good conversation. Took him over to the plant where we were going to have the presentation and where he was going to, to talk. And people, there were a bunch of people that came. And I was kind of wondering what was going to happen when we put out that Bruce Pearl was coming and he was going to be our main speaker because it was right in the middle of all of that. I didn't, I didn't know if people would show up. I took flack for inviting him. I took a lot of flack for him. Folks at our corporate headquarters, our, some of our plant managers, found out that I had written a contract and signed it without talking to them, so to them about it. I didn't ask for proof. What's the old saying, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for proof? I hate that, I hate that saying, by the way. But I did. I signed a contract, didn't ask them. I had him come to me. You need to cancel that contract. You need to get rid of him. Tell him not to come. I said, I'm not doing it. He's coming. So you have to fire me before I'll cancel that contract. So I took a lot of flack for it. I didn't know who would show up because of it. We had a big crowd. Big people, big crowd of folks from the community came. We walked in the building. They all just swarmed him. They were wanting autographs, pictures, talking to him. So I left him and I went to get things ready for the presentation. I came back, the crowd was all around him. I said, folks, I, I need to borrow Coach Pearl from you for a minute. Just for a minute. You're going in the room. <clears throat> He'll come in, he's agreed to stay after and sign for autographs, do pictures. You'll get to have your time, time with him. So let me borrow him for a minute. So I took him, I took him in the side room and let them go on. I sat him down, and I gave him a bottle of water. And I said, Coach, I just wanted to get you away from the crowd, give you a chance to kind of catch your breath and think about what you're going to say and, and, you know, have a bottle of water. He said, thank you. He said, I appreciate you doing that. And then I started talking to him after about a minute. I said, Coach Pearl, I just want you to know 
that I've taken a lot of flack for inviting you. And his body language was immediate. His shoulders slumped, he put his head down, literally put his head down, and he's sitting there just nodding his head. You could tell this man had been just beat up. And I guess he thought I was about to do some more of it, but I wasn't. That's, uh, it, it's time to move on. And so I tried to say some encouraging words to you. I said, Coach Fulmer thinks a lot of you. He has a lot of confidence in you. I trust Coach Fulmer, and so I'm going to trust you. I said, I believe you'll do a good job, and I just want you to know that I've got your back. And anything you need, I'm here to support you, and I trust that you're going to do a good job. I know you're going to do a good job. And when I said those things, you could just see literally the change in demeanor in this man. He sat up, he lifted his head up, and he looked me right in the eye. He said, Keith, you don't know how much I appreciate you saying that. And he said, we're going to motivate the fire out of him. I won't tell you the word he actually used. He said a cuss word. Wasn't a real bad cuss word, it was a cuss word. He said, we're going to motivate him. I said, good, let's go. And he did a great job. And he talked about his experience. And we had a bunch of young people there, very, very influential age. And he told, he, he told them about his lie. He told them what he did, what he did was wrong. And, he, and his message to those young people was never lie. Never lie. Always tell the truth. Because what he did was not really a bad thing. If he just told the truth about it, they probably would have gave a slap on the hand, maybe cut him down a couple of players, you know, his, his scholarships. But he wouldn't have got suspended and he wouldn't have got fired. It wasn't really what he did that was bad. I'll tell you what he did. He had a couple of recruits who had come to the campus. They were having a cookout at his house. And just on the spur of the moment, he said, hey, we're having a cookout. Would y'all like to come and have some hamburgers with us? And they came. That's a violation. You can't have recruits to your house. And when you break the rules, it's just like we used to say when I was in TWSWA. Coaches think they can break the rules and they're going to get away. I said, somebody's going to tell on you. And that's what happened. These crews went, hey, we went to Coach Pearl's house. Well, you can't do that. And, you know, they went to some other campus because they're going around looking at school, shopping where they're going to go to school. Hey, we went to Coach Pearl. Well, what's happened? I don't know what school it was, but they turned Tennessee in. They turned Coach Pearl in. And the CAA investigated him, and he lied. And it was the lie that got him in trouble. It was a lie that got him in trouble. And what's funny is there are a lot of other coaches who during that same time were doing the same thing, and not one of them got in trouble and got investigated. Nick Saban down in Alabama did the same thing. Had people to his house him and his wife would have Christmas breakfast and they would invite these recruits to come to their house and eat breakfast with them. That's a violation of the rule. Never got challenged. But that's not the point. That kind of thing happens. Injustice happens. He got caught. And when he got caught, he lied. And it brought a lot of problems. But he was remorseful. He wanted to pick himself up and go on. And it was time to do that. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. Because I want to talk about bruised reeds and smoking flax. Matthew quotes from Isaiah 42, prophecy about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He applies... What's said there 
about all the broken people that were coming to Jesus and said that he healed them all. That's Matthew's account, Matthew 12 and verses 14 through 21. I want to read from the passage that Matthew quotes and talk with you for a little while about this in Isaiah 42 in verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, <clears throat> whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth. What's under discussion there about the Messiah and His coming, I think it's interesting sometimes when we read these prophecies and it talks about what the Messiah was going to do to look at this passage here about what He was not going to do. And it says he was, he was not going to break the bruised reeds. He was not going to quench the smoke and flash. He said he would not fail nor be discouraged. Some other things there. But it's, it's those first two that I want to talk about. Not break the bruised reed, not, smoke, not quench the smoke and flash. What is that talking about? Well, the reeds, the, the Jews grew those people in that part of the, of, of the Bible lands would grow these reeds in their garden. I, I, I kind of compare it to maybe like a small cane pole. And they would use the reeds once they, they matured and dried out. They would use them for like stakes in their gardens or they'd make measuring rods out of them. But if while they were in their green state they got bruised they become no good. They become, they become unuseful. So if, if, if it got damaged, it was damaged goods, you just pull it up and you throw it away. It's bruised, it's no good, get rid of it. It's damaged. Flax was what they used as a wick in the oil lamp. Put the wick in the oil lamp, you go to light it, you expect for it to ignite, to catch fire, be able to provide light in the house. But sometimes some, you take a piece of flax and you put it in the oil, you try to light it, and it wouldn't light, it just sit there and smoke or smolder. It wouldn't ignite. So if it wouldn't ignite, didn't provide light, then its usefulness and its value, it's no good. You just pull it out, throw it away. Get rid of it. Get one that works and put it in there. Get one that's useful, put it in there. Now, the prophet, when talking about the Messiah, He's not talking about Jesus, what he's going to do with bruised reeds and smoking flax. He's talking about how Jesus was going to be with people. Because Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 42 in Matthew 12 when he talks about all the sick and the infirmed and the handicapped and the lepers and all of the people whose society would look upon as damaged goods. As people who are impotent. And the tendency when people are damaged in the world, especially in the cruel, barbaric world that existed under the Roman rule, the time of Jesus and the apostles is just get rid of them, replace them. And I'm afraid that that is the attitude of many today. The Lord wouldn't do that. He would take people who were hurting for whatever reason they're bruised. For whatever reason they don't have the potential that they could have. 
They're impotent. And it says that he won't throw it away. He won't get rid of it. He'll heal them all. And if we're going to be like our Lord, and I pray, and I believe everyone here, it is your desire, it is my desire, to be like our Lord and Savior Jesus, I think we need to be like that too. To see people who are hurting, and where they're hurting, and to be that balm of Gilead, right? Yes? Balm of Gilead. And heal them where we can. So with that, and give you maybe some understanding of where I've tried to be in my life, in my relationship with other people, whether it's at church or work or socially, I want to talk about dealing with the bruised reeds and the smoking flax. There are examples in the Bible. There are examples in your book. We, we could probably look at others. These were just three that I picked out of some broken people, the one that we've already talked about from 1 Corinthians 5, the brother who had committed sin. And the brethren were told it's time to stop kicking this man that's down. He has repented. He's remorseful. He's buried in sorrow. And it's time to lift him up. Another example is the woman who came to Jesus got his feet wet with her tears and began cleaning his feet with her hair. In Luke chapter 7, it describes that situation. And she is called a sinner. Now, all of us are sinners. But when the Bible uses the word sinner, it's using, in that text, it's using it in a special sense. And the scholars seem to be of the consensus that she was a harlot. May have been. Whatever she had done, the other people knew about it, were aware of it publicly. It was disgusting. They didn't want to have anything to do with it, and they were disgusted that Jesus was letting this sinner touching but Jesus saw a broken reed a broken person who needed healing not of a physical kind but of an emotional and spiritual kind and he gave this woman what she needed and he told her what she needed to hear. Your sins are forgiven. It's a beautiful thing. And I think about that. How many people are there out there that you and I know that need to hear you're forgiven? How many people in our lives, maybe a friend, family member, maybe a member of the church here that we've gotten crossways with? It happens. It happens. We haven't spoken to, they haven't spoken to us. The relationship hasn't been what it should be. It's been hurt, it's been broken. And they need to hear from us, I forgive you. If we're going to be like our Lord, we need to think about it. Another example is Peter. Luke chapter 22, impetuous, compulsive. Yes, he was 
all of those things, quick-tempered. Sometimes would open his mouth, it seemed like, before he was, had thought about what he was going to say. Yeah, he was all of those things. Lord, I'll never forsake you no matter what happens. I'll never deny you no matter what happens. Remember? Well, he did. The night which Jesus was betrayed, he followed our Lord to where the Lord was being tried. We know the story. He betrayed the Lord three times, the cock crow. Luke's account is the one I love the best. Luke 22, verses 54 through 62. Because that third time that Peter betrayed the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord looked at Peter. Peter was close enough that he could see his friend, Jesus, his Lord, that he'd been following around and gone through everything with the last three years. What was the look on Jesus' face? Was it a look of disappointment? Was it a look of sorrow? Was it a look of, of, I feel sorry for you, Peter, for what you just did? I don't know. We can just imagine. But whatever it was, when Peter saw the Lord looking at him, it says he went out and he wept uncontrollably. He was broken. And yet this impetuous man, this hot-tempered man, this man who sometimes his mouth was bigger (laughs) than his abilities, a man who other folks would look at and say, there's no way we want this guy on our team. No way we want to use him. The Lord wanted him. The Lord still wanted him on his team even after he denied him. The Lord forgave him and the Lord lifted him up and the Lord took Peter turned him into a great apostle. There's a lesson in that for us. The Lord doesn't take the strong. He takes the weak, the insignificant, the impotent, the broken, and he uses it. I think we should follow the example of our Lord. Isaiah 60 1 in verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Over in the book of Psalms, Psalms 34 and verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as are of a contrite spirit. So we see the spirit of our Lord and how he dealt with folks who failed. So we ask ourselves, how can we lift up others from failure? Well, I'm going to tell you, there are some things that we should not do. And again, if I mean, if you're in the book, I'm on page 16. Very quickly, we should not ignore a person's bad behavior. We're told to call it out. Ezekiel 3:18. We should not condone a person's bad behavior. You don't know how disappointed I have been over the years to see folks who condone others' bad behavior and make excuse. There's, there was no excuse for Coach Pearl's bad behavior. No excuse for it. And he needed to be called out for it. We should not enable a bad behavior. And I could tell you horror stories of things I saw as a high school coach. Parents enabling their child's behavior. And I'm like, why are we having this meeting? I get called in to the administrator of the principal's office because I would discipline some child, young person, teenager, who was playing for me 
they would go home and tell their parents about it. And the next thing you know, the parents would be down at the principal's office, the athletic director's office, and I'm saying, why are we having this meeting? You agree what they did is wrong. I agree with the, what they did is wrong. Their parents agree with what, that what they did was wrong. They just didn't like the idea that I called them out in punishment, called them on the carpet for it. And are you going to sit here and allow the parents to continue in enabling this child's behavior? Because this child is going to grow up and they're going to leave their father's and mother's household and they're going to go out on their own. And when they come to a bridge stone or someplace like where I work and they behave like that, their mom and dad ain't going to be able to walk into the plant manager and want to know, why did you fire my child? I need to grow up. I got on my soapbox for just a minute. I apologize. But there are bad stories that I've witnessed of people enabling others' bad behavior. We should not forgive a person's bad behavior when there's no remorse and there's no repentance. But when they do repent and they're remorseful, what we can do is forgive. We're taught to be forgiving, Ephesians 4 and verse 32. We can learn to trust. Yes, they made a mistake. Getting trust back is a difficult thing. When a person has done something wrong in their relationship with another person, the bond of trust has been destroyed, and sometimes that may never be restored. Or it may be hard. And I've seen people who would say, I'll forgive them, but I'll never trust them again as long as I live. We can be patient. We're taught to be patient in all things, with all people. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 14 and 15. We can exercise tough love. Hebrews chapter 12, we learn that the Lord chastens those who loves. The man in Corinth sinned. And the brethren, what Paul said, did to them was punishment. A lot of people don't like the idea of punishment. Discipline is not the enemy of enthusiasm. Think about it. Discipline sometimes might involve punishment. That's not a bad thing. Done correctly, and as long as the punishment fits the crime. <laughs> I've seen people go overboard sometimes, little things. These are the things that I hope that you will remember. In his commentary on the book of Isaiah, Brother Homer Haley made the following observation. There's a play on words in that text I found interesting. He says, he will not fail. And the, the, the meaning of the word fail means to burn dimly. To burn dimly. That's what flax that's smoking is doing. Nor be discouraged. The word discouraged means bruised. The bruised reed. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he have set justice in the earth. Although the servant will face many seemingly impossible obstacles and severely trying problems in his work, he will not succumb unlike those he comes to redeem. He will be free from weakness. Jesus can and will heal the broken reed and light the fire of faith to the smoking flax. It is about time that we imitated our Savior to help those who are hurting and weak. I was proud to be able to watch Coach Pearl recover. He left Tennessee and went to the University of Auburn, and he's done a good job. And this is what I would say to the young people and to others. Don't let failure define who you are. I've seen too many people do that. Judas is an example. Judas let failure define him in a bad way. Think about it. I want you to read with me from Proverbs very quickly. I know our time's gone. Proverbs 24. I want you to think about this. Keep this in mind. Please keep this point in mind. Verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> For a just man falleth seven times 
and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Listen close. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. And let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Lest the Lord see it and it displease him. And he turn away his wrath from him. I hope you'll let that sink in. I appreciate you listening. Let us learn to trust and forgive and lift others up from their failure.